Welcome back to Clarity of Concept. This is modern Indian history video series for UPSC and all other exams. Follow our playlist and subscribe to our channel for all videos. Visit our website clarityofconcept.com for notes and updates. In the last few videos, we explored the rise and fall of the Portuguese and the Dutch in India, followed by the story of the French from 1664 to 1746. In this video, we shall focus on the English presence in India, tracing their journey from 1600 to 1746. We have already explained in the previous video why the year 1746 holds such significance. Before 1746, the English and the French largely avoided direct conflicts in India, engaging only in minor skirmishes. However, after 1746, their rivalry escalated into full-blown wars, setting the stage for the English to eventually emerge victorious and establish their dominance over the entire subcontinent. In this video, we will explore the English journey from the formation of the East India Company in 1600 to their rising power by 1746. Before we dive into the specifics of the English in India, it is important to understand the broader context. In the 16th century, India was a land of multiple Indian powers ruling various territories across the subcontinent. While these Indian rulers controlled the land, the surrounding maritime region, particularly the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean, was dominated by the Portuguese. They effectively held power over the seas and the coastal trade routes. However, this dominance was not to last. The 17th century brought new European competitors, the Dutch and the English. Both began to challenge the Portuguese hold over these waters. The Dutch directly confronted the Portuguese, engaging in fierce naval battles and wars and eventually succeeded in capturing many of the Portuguese holdings. The English approach, however, was different. They didn't engage in large, direct battles with the Portuguese, but instead managed to take control of their areas through a process known as supplanting. Supplanting refers to replacing someone or something in a position of power or importance, often in a gradual and indirect manner. For example, imagine you have a favorite shop in your neighborhood. One day, another shop opens nearby, offering better products or prices. Over time, without any conflict, more and more people start visiting the new shop and eventually, the old shop loses its customers and closes down. This is what the English did to the Portuguese. They gradually outcompeted them economically and diplomatically, without large-scale military confrontation. The question might arise, why didn't the English directly fight the Portuguese? There are a few reasons for this. First, by the time the English were gaining a foothold in India, Portuguese power was already waning due to conflicts with the Dutch and other European powers. The English saw no need for a direct confrontation when they could simply take over territories by outmaneuvering them through trade and diplomacy. Second, the English East India Company was primarily focused on building profitable trade networks and establishing good relations with local rulers rather than wasting resources on costly wars. As a result, the English never thought of completely evicting the Portuguese from the remaining territories. This is why the Portuguese continued to hold small pockets of land like Goa, Daman and Diu until as late as 1961, long after the English had established full control over India. With this broader context, we can now move into the details of the English journey from 1600 to 1746. The English East India Company was formed in 1600 by a group of merchants in London with the support of Queen Elizabeth I. Their aim was to trade with the East Indies which included India. In 1608, the first English ship under the command of Captain William Hawkins arrived at the port of Surat in western India. Hawkins went to the court of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir seeking permission to trade, but his efforts were blocked by the Portuguese, 
who had already established a strong presence in the region. As a result, Hawkins returned without securing any significant trade rights. Despite this setback, the English didn't give up. In 1611, they established their first trading post or factory in Masuli Patnam on the southeastern coast of India with the permission of the local rulers. This gave the English a foothold, but tensions with the Portuguese remained high. The turning point came in 1612 with the Battle of Swally near the port of Surat. The Portuguese, determined to maintain control over the maritime trade, sent a fleet of four large ships and 26 smaller vessels to attack the English. The English, led by Captain Thomas Best, had only four ships. Despite being outnumbered, the English used their superior naval tactics and firepower to defeat the Portuguese fleet. The battle lasted several days, with the Portuguese suffering heavy losses. The English ships, though fewer, were stronger and better armed which helped them secure a decisive victory. This victory at Swally had significant consequences. It impressed the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, who saw the English as a rising power capable of challenging the Portuguese. As a result, Jahangir granted the English permission to establish a factory at Surat in 1613. The factory was formally established soon after, in 1615 marking a major milestone for the English East India Company. This gave the English a stronger position in India and opened the door to future expansions. Following this success, in 1615, the English sent Sir Thomas Rowe as an ambassador to the Mughal court. Thomas Rowe spent three years in the court of Jahangir from 1615 to 1618 negotiating trade deals for the East India Company. His diplomatic mission was highly successful. Rowe managed to secure several key agreements that allowed the English to expand their trade operations and establish more factories without facing significant interference from the Mughals. After completing his mission, Rowe returned back to England, having laid the groundwork for the company's growth in India. This early phase of English involvement in India marked the foundation for their eventual dominance in the region. By using both diplomacy and strategic victories, like the Battle of Swally, the English slowly but steadily built their influence in India. In 1639, the English made another important move by establishing a settlement in Madras, which is now called Chennai. The East India Company secured a piece of land from the local ruler, the Nayak of Vandavasi, and built Fort St. George. This settlement grew quickly and became the company's major hub on the southeastern coast of India, serving as a crucial point for trade with Southeast Asia and China. In 1651, the English East India Company set up its factory in Bengal at a town called Hooghly along the Hooghly River. This was their initial entry into Bengal, which later became a key region for their trade. A significant event occurred in 1661 when the island of Bombay was handed over to the English as part of a royal marriage agreement between King Charles II of England and Catherine of Braganza, a Portuguese princess. The Portuguese had controlled Bombay since the early 1500s. But as part of Catherine's dowry, the territory was transferred to the English crown. In 1668, the English crown leased Bombay to the East India Company for a nominal rent of £10 per year. The company quickly recognized the potential of Bombay's natural harbour and began developing it into a key trading port. Between 1686 and 1689, the English found themselves in conflict with the Mughal Empire in what became known as the Anglo-Mughal War. Tensions escalated when the East India Company, growing increasingly ambitious, 
decided to assert more control over its trade and settlements. The English attacked Mughal ships and tried to seize control of key Mughal territories. However, the Mughals, led by Emperor Aurangzeb, responded swiftly. The English were soundly defeated. Their factories in Hooghly and other places were seized and many English officials were imprisoned. As punishment, the Mughal Empire imposed strict conditions on the East India Company. The English were forced to apologize, pay a large fine and promise not to interfere with the Mughal ships again. This war was a harsh lesson for the company, which realized that it needed to be more cautious in dealing with the powerful Mughal Empire. Despite the defeat, the English learned to adopt a more diplomatic and strategic approach in their dealings with Indian rulers after this. In 1690, after resolving conflicts with the Mughal Empire, the English East India Company re-established itself in Bengal. By 1698, the company officially acquired the three villages, Sutanuti, Kalikata and Govindpur from the local Mughal authorities. These villages were combined to form what would become Calcutta, now called Kolkata. The English then built Fort William to protect their settlement and growing trade operations. This marked the beginning of Calcutta's rise as the company's major centre of power in eastern India. In 1707, the death of Emperor Aurangzeb marked the beginning of the decline of the Mughal Empire. As we discussed in the previous video, challenging the Mughal authority before this point was extremely difficult. This was clearly seen during the Anglo-Mughal Wars, where the British faced severe punishments for interfering with Mughal ships, including the loss of factories and heavy fines. However, after Aurangzeb's death, the central power of the Mughal Empire began to weaken and over the following decades, the British and other regional powers found more opportunities to expand their influence as the Mughals struggled to maintain control over the vast empire. In 1717, the Mughal Emperor Farooq Siyar granted the English East India Company a royal farman. This firman was a significant milestone as it provided the British with several key privileges. Most importantly, it allowed them to trade freely in Bengal, Gujarat and Hyderabad without paying custom duties, which gave the company a huge economic advantage over other traders. Additionally, it granted the British the right to rent land around Calcutta for a very small fee further strengthening their position in Bengal. Following this, from 1720 to 1740, the British steadily expanded their influence across India. They established more factories, secured favourable trade agreements with local rulers and built stronger forts to protect their growing interests. The weakening Mughal Empire, coupled with local rivalries among Indian rulers, allowed the British to consolidate their power with minimal resistance during this period. This expansion set the stage for the larger conflicts with other European powers, particularly the French, in the years to come. Around 1740, the English found it necessary to interfere in local rivalries, especially in southern India as the French had started supporting local rulers against their rivals to gain trade advantages. This French involvement in regional politics and conflicts posed a direct threat to the growing British interests. The competition between the two European powers in India set the stage for broader conflicts in the coming years, known as the Carnatic Wars. These wars would play a crucial role in determining who would dominate trade and political power in India. We will study these events in more detail in the upcoming videos. Follow our playlist and visit our website clarityofconcept.com for notes and additional updates. The link is given in the description box below. Subscribe to our channel Clarity of Concept.